welcome to Seeing Me on the Screen. I'm your host, Hannah, and each week I am honoured to engage in meaningful conversations with an incredible lineup of guests. From disability rights advocates to artists, filmmakers to everyday heroes, our guests bring a wealth of diverse perspectives that enrich our discussions. These stories and insights are invaluable as we analyse and uncover the narratives surrounding female disability in mass media. Your voice matters. Email us at seeingmeonthescreenpod at gmail.com with any guest suggestions or topics you'd like us to delve into. Today's guest is Catherine Bullock, the president of the Women and Gender Minorities in Science Club at Victoria University of Wellington. Let's get into the discussion. So, hi Catherine. <laughs> Thank you for coming on today. Hi. Very much appreciated. Appreciate your time. I thought we could get started by just asking because I know that you're the president of the Women and Gender Minorities in Science. So what inspired you to create the club in the first place? The lack of a club. Yes. Uh, basically, so I'm a third year at Vic and at the end, well, I came here in first year and I was really excited to get involved with the clubs. I, of course, study science as well. There's the fantastic Women in Tech Club. They're amazing and they do quite a lot for the general STEM community. But on this, like, I signed up for them in first year and they ask you to state your major. And obviously, physics does not really apply under tech. And there's an engineering club at Vic, there's a science collective at Vic, but I also, yeah, there's no woman in stuff. There was no woman in science club. And so I decided to create that, to create that space and that sense of community. Also, particularly because I find that there's, as a physics student, I don't really interact with chem or bio students that much, and I would love to. In terms of the gender minorities part, I wanted to include that in the title because quite often a lot of women like focused groups will sort of have like a subheading saying like non-binary and trans people welcome. But I find that's very unclear for trans men or trans masculine people. And I wanted to make sure that they had a space because I know that they can not feel too at home in men's spaces but also it's quite invalidating if there's only really a woman's space as well so yeah. I tried to I made sure to put gender minorities in the title so that it was very clear that we would welcome anyone mm-hmm. maybe I should do that with my podcast too <laughs> all the snaps for you to take the initiative because that's the kind of things that are going to create change in the first place is like noticing things that aren't there and being like hey guess what we've made a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly we've made a podcast we've made a club and you, everyone can join the club everyone's going to be best friends as long as you have a passion for the thing mm, exactly totally thing. <laughs> Ariana DeBoss icon anyway wow icon how, and- how long did that take me to start talking about musicals eight um, minutes <laughs> eight minutes it's eight fine. minutes <laughs> anyway so one of my fun questions for you is about the prominence of imposter syndrome, particularly for women and gender minorities in male-dominated fields like science, like physics and mathematics mm-hmm. and STEM. So in your opinion, how can we build confidence and self-assurance in these individuals to empower them to pursue leadership roles in the future and contribute to the scientific community? That's a really interesting question because it's people studying science because there have been role models that I have looked up to as I've been growing up for like different types of women who work in science not a lot but there are some but the problem is it's like with any industry that it's a level system so you have people studying undergrad then you have people studying postgrad then you have people working in industry and then you have like quite successful people with like PhDs or lecturers And because of how long that takes someone, it means that there are different levels of diversity depending on where you are. So I feel really lucky at the moment because my undergrad education is full of a lot of other women and other gender minorities that I get to work with. And it's fantastic, especially in physics, which is one of the most male dominated out of the three. And so I feel really lucky because I haven't come across too much imposter syndrome, at least in my own personal experience, because I am surrounded by other women. And I think that's the main key is having a community of people who know your experiences firsthand, who you can talk to, because when it gets to situations where you, you're starting internships, like 
like I did over the summer, or you're entering post-grad where less and less women are statistically likely to go into, and when you come across all of your lecturers who are likely going to be men, it helps to have like friends in a community stand by you. And imposter syndrome is also a vicious thing because it's very insistent. And sometimes you don't realize you are thinking like you're an imposter when I think everyone thinks it's, or, or the way it is, has always been explained to me is it sounds like something you're supposed to pick up quite, you start thinking imposter syndrome and then you think, oh, I have imposter syndrome. Let's not do that. But it's quite often something that you don't realize you're thinking about yourself. Mm. And having those people to talk to and having those people who really value you, even as friends, even like some of my like male friends who I work with in undergrad, sometimes I'll sort of like share some insecurities and they'll go, you don't need to think that. You're actually like just as smart as the rest of us. Don't need to worry. Mm. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's having a community and having uh, role models. But the I feel like the further we go on and the generations to come the more female like more female and gender minority role role models we will have as we go on yeah and in relation to that what do you think would be some common barriers that prevent you know females and gender minority people from going into the sciences well I'll start with my personal experiences because that's the stuff I can best speak on and then I'll sort of go into other things that some of my friends and other people I know have experienced because they're quite different I'm aware that I've come from a very privileged background where my parents really encouraged me to do whatever I wanted and encouraged me to consider the sciences and because I've always really be sure that like of what I wanted to do but I think the main thing that I have come across is little tiny assumptions I wouldn't go far as to call them microaggressions but it's the certain attitudes people have I suppose this came after me deciding to study science but whenever I would tell anyone that I was going into a physics degree they would look at me in shock and horror maybe it's because of their perception that physics is hard but also I I know some of my male friends haven't gotten that as much as me like yeah I get a lot of like shock and surprise of oh my gosh isn't that really hard and like it is but I like it and uh, physics is fantastic and deserves to be studied and I think it's really cool I would also say it's just definitely the lack of expectation on me a lot of my friends who went to all male schools or like all boys schools Mm. they got an insane amount of pressure to go into STEM whereas women don't and I actually think that uh the having no pressure is better because you can go into exactly what you want to study however the severe expectation for men to go into those engineering and STEM fields I feel contributes to the disparity and just because yeah when 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 you're in college and people are talking about possible careers you can go into the main thing that's pushed on men is engineering and with women yeah or at least that's what I've heard I have a similar situation where you know I was from a pretty middle of the road college yes and you know I was one of three females in my final year like computer science digital technology class that I did and the amount of pressure that I got to go into digital technology and like STEM was absolutely astounding because they were like oh my gosh there's going to be scholarships there's going to be like all this stuff yeah I'm like I do it because I enjoy it I don't do it because of the money side I definitely felt very very pressured into it from a lot of my teachers which I get where they were coming from like oh neurodivergent person go into STEM go brr like that whole stereotype I couldn't see myself doing that five days a week. I can see myself doing that full time because the amount of like stress it caused me being like, where are the bugs? Where are the bugs? Receive that type of, I yeah, let's call it pressure in that sort, in that sort mm. of situation where you're good at a subject. Of course, the teachers that are passionate about it would want you to. But yeah, I think it's the disparity of how women are encouraged to do whatever they want. And generally speaking, women are encouraged to do whatever they, they want to. And men are encouraged to go into STEM. Or even like the stereotype of men being like, oh, you're going to go into psychology so you can pick up chicks, like that kind of rhetoric surrounding the going. I didn't even think of that. (laughs) It's just like, 
or like for example a male going into like dancing or whatever that's like oh my gosh you're being so revolutionary you know you're yeah it's like shocking to people yeah however this is these are all very privileged stances to be taking because in New Zealand there's not actually actual barriers for women studying STEM or in the UK or in America really there's like plenty of equity scholarships regarding women and gender minorities going into STEM subjects to even out that gender balance but there are still countries in which it's illegal for women to learn Mm -hmm. and so and also that where gender minorities aren't even acknowledged so it's a good thing that I like to put into perspective is that like we do have a vast amount of opportunities in front of us it's just about doing the best we can to eliminate eliminate any further like barriers we come into yeah with common barriers networking also plays a crucial role in like career advancement for females and gender minorities who could feel excluded from the traditional you know bro energy (laughs) of stem fields well finance isn't STEM, is it? No. So. <laughs> Ew, imagine accounting. <laughs> imagine imagine paying for a media studies degree. Couldn't be me. Um, <laughs> honestly, the amount of like crap I got of people being like, what are you doing? Because like they assumed that, you know, me being a smart person meant that I was going to go into, yeah. you know, like a STEM thing. I was like, at the time I was like, LCCM, so literary and creative communication. They were like, oh, cool. Mm, <laughs> People yeah. don't realise there are different types of intelligence. Yeah, literally, even at the job field context, there was this job field that happened last week on campus, and um, mm-hmm. I felt so, like, not sidelined, but, like, I know that people be like, ha-ha, humanities don't have any job opportunities, but, like, it felt even worse when I was at the job field. It was just a bunch of, like, people asking for engineering stuff, and I went with my friend who's an engineer, and she's a female engineer, and, like, seeing how they approached her when she said she was going into engineering versus me, like their face would fall if it'd be like humanities and then it'd be like mm. <laughs> well also that's because that's that's probably because they're that they're engineers and they like what they like they like seeing people succeed at what they succeeded at and I also think with STEM jobs particularly engineering like when you study engineering you work at an engineering company yeah yeah but whereas with humanities there's such a wide range of jobs you can go and read that it's not necessarily like you don't go to be a you don't work at a media studies corporation (laughs) you know like that doesn't exist because there's such a wide range of skills that you get from that degree yeah exactly and I'd rather have those opportunities made available to me over time rather than being like ah yes engineering firm let me go and simp over the fang people or something (laughs) for that fang is for like the Facebook, Amazons, etc. of the world that all the fancy concepts oh. we try to get into, and that's why there's a giant act. So the unethical stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could could not relate. <laughs> no, it's fine. So representation is vital for inspiring the next generation of scientists. How do you think we can increase the visibility of successful female and gender minority sciences to combat these kind of barriers and stereotypes and to encourage more diverse participation in science? Oh, this is a really interesting one because there's diversity on, or like diversity of, diversity in what you consume on an individual level and then on like a B. The first sort of physics related book that I read outside of like children's books about space was Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. And that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. But I felt so much more at home in my decision to study physics when I read The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, by Katie Mack, a female physicist. On an individual level, you can choose what to consume. And if you are studying anything, like if you're a female or gender minority studying anything male-dominated, I would really recommend looking into diverse literature or just media in general about the stuff that you study by the minorities you fit into like it did a lot for myself like my self-confidence to like yeah read words by a very smart woman who went through the same sort of steps that I'm going through now Mm. and so on an individual level I think to 
you can put in work to make sure that you are very sure of yourself and you know sort of the history of of women in physics etc etc well for me it would be like women and gender minorities in physics etc but for for everyone else it could be different sorts of sciences and different different fields that they're specifically in like also learning about Henrietta von astronomical data so cool to learn about and so cool to read about particularly so yeah on an individual level I would say start by consuming media where you can see yourself in which yeah. I'm aware can be hard and where that and that's what gets to the macro level stuff yeah <laughs> where, yeah where I think again we're in an age where there's a whole lot more media being made about women in STEM and that's fantastic but it is still not as much as we've previously had there aren't very many historical sort of records of it it's all very recent stuff Mm. and for that I think that's where we need these organizations specifically directed towards women and gender minorities who put people who have studied STEM and who are women and gender minorities on these pedestals to show them not in a like they can do no wrong sense of a pedestal, but more of a showcase of we need these organizations to specifically show people who are potentially thinking about it that it is doable and it isn't impossible. Yeah. And it's there's a community surrounded there. And the ideal thing to happen is that the general organizations involved in any sorts of STEM showcasing those voices as well Mm. although I'm aware that is in a perfect world and that does not always happen yeah like I remember when I first started reading about neurodiversity and I thought when I went back through the historical literature I was just like most of these studies are conducted by men that are you know analyzing characteristics of men and it was just like this male phenotype and like that kind of you know seeing that progress and then reading autism and heels reading reading Chanel Mariah's book plug for this is ADHD which just came out Chanel was on a previous episode it's it's just so interesting when you said about like the physics aspect of like reading and consuming what you'd like to see and it's the same thing with neurodiversity When, you know, if you don't see yourself represented in the first place, how are you going to realize those characteristics also apply to you as well? If you were to go and read like Women in Heels, you know, a lot of Devon Price's stuff, they do a lot of, you know, gender minority neurodiversity stuff where like they try to make it as less categorical as possible when they're trying to explain diversity. And I'm just like, well, if you are from those minority communities and there's not a lot of information available about certain conditions and the way they present in different, you know, quote unquote, unstereotypical manners, like how are you going to know? And even then there's a space in media for specifically gender minorities in STEM because mm. gender mi- the term gender minorities even then is very recent. Like while we have existed for so long, it has always there has been there's it's been divisive as to what words to use of course trans has been around for a while but then in the 60s yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff and so gender minorities as a blanket term has come is is still only very recent and even then there are still not many people being put on as on spotlight Mm. so yeah so I think I think there's a yeah there's a missing piece of media with for those Venn diagrams there's literature like (laughs) women in STEM but not necessarily about gender minorities in STEM yeah like the Deloitte industry reports and things like that the diversity equity and inclusion reports that come out every year which are very Mm. interesting to read I know they sound very boring but they're actually really interesting to see we'll go on to one of the more fun questions then so when we're talking about like advocacy and representing female gender minority people the burden of advocating for diversity practices often falls on those scientists themselves if they don't see themselves represented in normal workplace environments so what strategies do you think organizations can take practice steps to champion diversity and create institutional structures that uphold inclusivity so it doesn't fall on just the individual i would say like in a perfect world which obviously we're not in, but in a perfect case, who, what, like, like men and even like women sticking up for gender minorities, when they notice that there's not particularly any room, there's not particularly any 
like ideas as all else it's not very inclusive and in an ideal world they would be the ones to notice and speak up as well as gender minorities and people with the courage to speak up but particularly mm. if they're like a part of the gender minorities they'll speak up etc however that doesn't happen and I don't think all of it is out of malice I think that you don't realize that some people are being excluded if you yourself are included. And so while it's the ideal, and I would expect that allies try to notice, some things will slip through the cracks. And so often by necessity, the the burden of representation and inclusion does in a way need to fall on women and gender minorities. However, to counteract that, pay gender minorities and women time to sit down and have an inclusive discussion as to what needs need to be met. Because that, in my way, in my own view, is the best way to, for, in a very corporation-focused, like, neoliberal question. Yeah yeah <laughs> but also yeah your sp- your question was specifically addressing like companies etc mm. is if like to be totally inclusive the best person to ask is the person that needs to be included mm. and instead of asking them to do free and so that's that would be my reaction yeah and if you'd like do you have any you know resources you'd recommend to the listeners interested in, in learning more about diversity inclusion and the experiences of female and gender minority scientists any you know fun books oh, i saw this question in advance and then i thought oh yeah i'm gonna look some of this stuff up and then i totally <laughs> forgot to it's okay um, i would say just generally hmm. the end of everything astrophysically speaking by katie mack that's mm-hmm. not necessarily about any it's not at all about like any sort of gender inequality in science however it is a fantastic like idea to just no matter who you are read diverse literature about or like and consume diverse media about the subjects that you like and enjoy like I'm not going to force you to read about physics if you don't like physics but if you're into physics I would also say again just generally the Guilty Feminist podcast I'm a big fan of them they do comedy podcasts about just being a feminist and like but also like how it's it's really funny for people a little a little nervous about podcasts but it's very fun like if the main focus is how can we better society to create it more equal to women they're very intersectional and inclusive towards queer people pocs and yeah and and gender minorities they're so cool very intersectional love them and they do sometimes do specific science science like sciencey episodes and so they like bring oh hold on i'm gonna google someone really quickly dr michelle dickinson she's nano girl she's new zealand based and she specifically does a lot of stuff to do with science communication basically well she is a science communicator so she teaches you about and that yeah i'll i'll leave it there and plug my socials my name is Catherine bullet i have instagram my public account is my music account so i also do music so you're going to get my music content it is at Catherine bullet music and Catherine is spelt with a c and now if people like what they hear they can come hear you sing too yeah totally I why that was so aggressive oh my goodness I was just like, yeah. <laughs> well I mean I please love that. well guess where I'm gonna be next week then <laughs> and my gig you're gonna come you're gonna be there I'll try my <laughs> best if you can show up for me then I can show up for you <laughs> oh my god thank you so thank you so much for talking to me I really you're so welcome hey Thank you for joining us on this episode of Seeing Me on the Screen. We hope you found our discussion insightful and thought-provoking. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify for more engaging discussions about female disability in movies, TV shows, theatre and beyond. Remember that your voice matters. Email us at seeingmeonthescreenpod at gmail.com with any guest or topic suggestions. Thank you again for listening to Seeing Me on the Screen. Until next time, let's keep sharing untold stories and work towards a world where everyone can see themselves represented on the screen.